Amen. I am so grateful to be with you, and uh, I have what I believe to be a message from the Lord for us. Uh, I um, put together uh, this, these, these thoughts that I had um, floating around in my head about, you know, how preachers do. It's like you, can't, you know what you want to say, and you know the scriptures you want to talk about, and uh, I was at, at the gym working out last night, and I just, uh, during worship, I just sensed the presence of the Lord, and I felt these, uh, this message coalesce. And uh, as I was beginning to pray about, you know, how I was going to present it and how I was going to organize it, uh, something drastic happened uh, in our nation. And uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, you know, uh, um, former President Trump uh, was shot at um, in, in the middle of uh, a rally. And as you can imagine, emotions have been flying high in response. And whatever your politics, it really does not matter at all to me. Obviously, we look at the, the, the place our nation is in emotionally, and I think whether you lean right or whether you lean left, you can probably say things are not the way they should be presently. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if that, if that's me or not, uh, that, uh, that crackle. Yeah, I'll try to, try to fix it, but maybe I won't be able to. Uh, if, if need be, we can switch if it does it some more. Um, yeah, we'll just switch it. <laughs> Thank you. Is it on? Okay, great. It's on. All right. Um, do we have something I could just set this on? I don't know if there's something there. That'd be handy for me. Thank you, Pastor Toby. Thank you, thank you. All right. There we go. All right. Pardon our technological difficulties here. Awesome. That'll work. That'll work. Okay. All right. So, um, wherever you lean on the political spectrum, I think it's pretty obvious that our nation, the soul of our nation is sick. But what the world needs is not a political figurehead. What the world needs is not just the right policies to be, begin to put into place. And if you tweak the, tweak the budget here, and if you, if you institute this policy over here, and you trim around the edges here, suddenly our nation will be better. I don't think for a moment that that is even close to what our nation is in desperate need of. What our nation needs and what the world needs is a church that looks like Jesus. Because Jesus himself said that you are the light of the world. And if we are the light of the world, and we don't shine, then there's probably not a lot of hope. It is essential, it is essential that we understand how to shine. And uh, this is really the, the context in which I want to present the, the message that I have for you today. Because really what I want to talk to you about is something called spiritual warfare. Now spiritual warfare is probably one of the most misunderstood topics within the Christian life. At least as far as I'm concerned. And maybe I'm misunderstanding it and I'm... I'm the one who's wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> of course, you know, who thinks that they're wrong uh, and continues to hold that position? Uh, only a fool, right? So um, I, I want to break down for you this topic of spiritual warfare because I think that many of us, uh, either we don't wage spiritual warfare, in which case I've got news for you, you're losing, or we fight it wrongly because we've misunderstood it. I want to just do some exegesis on sort of what is the, the big 
spiritual warfare passage in Ephesians chapter 6. And I want us to understand what is being talked about, and then I'm going to make it practical so that there's something we can do after we've heard this message. Because I believe that if we understand and obey the scriptures, especially as it pertains to this topic, we will be a light that brings hope to the world around us. So if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I want you to just begin to take in what Paul just said right there. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we do have a fight. And that fight is with these things called rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. I'm going to take a moment in a minute after we've read the passage to break down for you what that means, but I want us to pay attention that it is important for us to understand what we are fighting if we are to fight well. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, so let's break down what the passage is talking about. First, um, he's saying to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Whose might are we to be strong in? In the strength of his might. If you are fighting spiritual warfare in your own strength, you are losing. And some of us, we, we fight with, this, with our own strength like this. Oh, dear. Things are getting pretty bad. I better do something about that. I better make sure that everyone knows where I stand. On this issue, I better go on Facebook and I better air my opinions so that everyone will know that I'm on the right side. How many of you have been that person before? You know, show of hands, you confess. I've been that person many times. So, you know, you're, we're amongst friends here, okay? Here's another way that we can fight spiritual warfare in our own strength. We begin to pray like orphans. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, he says, you know, you have a father in heaven who knows what you need before you even ask. So when you pray, don't go babbling like pagans because they think that by their many words, they will be heard. So what are pagans? They're people, or rather Gentiles, some translations put it, Gentiles. They're people who don't know Father God. And so they, they pray like they have to make it happen, that by their prayers, uh, they have the answer. Some of us in intercession, we begin to pray wrongly. 
because we begin to pray not with confidence that we have a God who hears our needs, who knows our needs before we even ask. Instead, we think that our prayer is what does the warfare. And if we pray more, and if we pray louder, and if we pray harder, that somehow our harder praying will get the answer that we're looking for. Now listen, I'm all for praying with fervency. But it is not our fervency that brings the answer. And here's a subtle difference that I want you to begin to internalize even now when you think about intercession and how you're to pray. If you believe that the nature of your praying is the thing that gets the answer, you have faith in your prayers and not in the one listening. Faith comes by trusting in God, not in your praying. We pray because we trust him. And when you pray because you trust him, you can pray fervently, knowing that in your fervency, merely you are bearing your soul before your father who knows what you need. But when you begin to trust that if, if I pray fervently and I fast and I pray and I can try to twist God's arm to get him to do what I want to do, suddenly you've forgotten that you have a father. And you're praying not to Father God, you are praying to a system where I put in X and I get out Y. This is not Christian prayer. Christian prayer begins with this. What did Jesus say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says this, your kingdom come and your will be done. Okay, so what is this thing about the kingdom? Because this is actually going to be very important for what we're talking about in spiritual warfare. It is essential that you understand what is the kingdom of heaven. I used to think that the kingdom of heaven was the place you go when you die. And so it was very confusing to me to hear Jesus tell parables that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It starts out with this tiny little seed and you put it in the ground and it becomes the biggest plant in the garden. And I would think, Jesus, what in the world does that have to do with heaven? And Jesus says, don't worry, John Mark, I'll explain it to you. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. You get a little bit of yeast and you put it in some dough and, and, and before long, that whole lump of dough has yeast in it. Make sense? No, <laughs> not even a little bit. I have no idea what you're talking about, Jesus. Because I think that, that I, I was thinking that the, the kingdom of heaven was the place you go when you die. But that's not what the kingdom of heaven is. At least it's not limited to that place. In, in fact, the kingdom of heaven is not about geography. The kingdom of heaven is about authority. This word kingdom comes from two English words that we just smashed together into a word sandwich. It's king and dominion. So a kingdom is where the king has dominion. It is the effective range of God's rule and his authority. Another way to think about the kingdom is God in action, where God gets what he wants. So the kingdom of heaven is not this celestial thing up here because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven doesn't come with observation. You can't say, hey, there it is, or, or there it is, because the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you or among you, depending on the translation you're reading. And um, I'm, I'm no Greek scholar. Some, some translations say the kingdom of heaven is within you. Some of them say the kingdom of heaven is among you. I just take it to be both. You know, the kingdom of heaven is within me, and the kingdom of heaven is present when the people of God are gathered. So what are we talking about here? I want you to have this, this concept in mind as we talk about spiritual warfare because spiritual warfare is all about the advancement of the kingdom of God. Is this making sense to you? So, if 
Well, so uh, in 2014, I went to Egypt and uh, on a short-term missions trip, and uh, uh, a missionary drove us past the American consulate and said, hey, that is the American consulate. If something bad goes down, by the way, we were there during an election, scary time to be in the Middle East. And uh, so you, know, you see, you hear fireworks going off at night and you're like, boy, I hope those are fireworks. And, uh, you know, so um, I saw this like, you know, 12 year old kid with an AK-47 just walking down the streets like, where am I? So you're driving in this sandy desert and you see the American consulate and the missionary friend says, that is American soil. If you cross the threshold of that property, you're no longer in Egypt. You are in the United States of America. Well, that's weird because the sand on this side of the imaginary line looks suspiciously similar to the sand on this side of the imaginary line. It's all right. It'll be fine, I hope. So, <laughs> so if, if the sand on this side and the sand on this side looks the same, the thing that is separating two kingdoms is just this line right here. What does that tell you? Well, when you're on this side of the property line, you are governed by different laws. That tells you that kingdom isn't about geography. It's not about location. It's about authority and who's in charge. The kingdom of heaven is all about the king. The gospel of the kingdom is all about the rule of King Jesus. And spiritual warfare is all about the advancement of the rule of King Jesus. This being on the floor is bothering you, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it up. We'll find out if my iPad survived. It's fine. Okay, I don't know what that piece is, though. That, might, that piece might not have survived. I'm sorry, Pastor Steve. You're gone. But as you're watching this, hopefully things will start out. Let me set this down real quick. Stay. Okay. All right. So as we're talking about the authority of King Jesus and the advancement of King Jesus, I want you to have that in mind when we read this passage of Ephesians 6 again. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay, so there's King Jesus, but then there's this other thing called powers and authorities. Well, what the heck are those? Now, some of you might immediately think demons, and yeah, basically, you're right. But what are the ways in which these demons manifest themselves in the world? Of course, we've had deliverance moments where you cast out demons from people. I've done that many times, in fact, very recently, casting out demons from folks. That's part of the w spiritual warfare, but it's only a small part. It's only a small part because there are more ways in which there are the powers and authorities begin to exert their influence in the world. Um, if you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, it says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, in some uh, translations uh, in the NIV, it will say uh, uh, the sons of Israel. This is uh, one of those uh, discrepancies between a thing called the Masoretic Text and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint. And so um, I'm not going to get into the details of the scholarship on this, but I'll just say the older versions say sons of God, and it was later changed to say sons of Israel. 
What is being said here in Deuteronomy 32, 8? I think that we can only understand it when we look as well at Psalm 82. If you'll turn with me to Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long... Okay, in the midst of the, of the what he holds judgment? In the midst of the gods. This is really interesting. There's this thing here in Psalm 82 called the divine council that's happening. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hands of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations." Okay, this last verse, for you shall inherit all the what? The nations. What's being judged here? Who are being judged? The gods. The gods are ruling without justice. And they, uh, they govern the nations according to Deuteronomy 32, 8. The, the nations are, are governed by the sons of God. Here is what is the ancient Near Eastern worldview. The demons that, uh, what we call demons in, in, um, uh, in Hebrew, it's called shedim. Now, these demonic principalities, the, the ancient Israelites, they viewed the false gods of the nations not as mere make-believe um, entities. Ancient Israelites believed that Baal existed and was a real entity. They just believed that he was a rival to the one true God. The Apostle Paul says the same thing, in fact. He says that the, the idols that the pagans worship are demons. These are rivals to God's authority, but... In Deuteronomy 32, it seems as though there's this divine council and God has, has, uh, has allotted the nations to these, these you know, uh, entities that were meant to rule under his authority. But they rebelled. They rebelled. Does that sound familiar? Do we know of another divine entity that has rebelled against God? His name is the devil. <laughs> And he's rebelled against God, and so have these, these gods of the nations, lowercase g. These, and this is my opinion, by the way, but it's backed up by quite a bit of scholarship. There's a guy by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser who's done a lot of work on this. It is, it is my opinion that when Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and authorities, the principalities, these cosmic powers of the air, what he is saying is we are locked in a battle against these demonic strongholds that are waging warfare, rebelling against God's authority. This is the, the people that are being judged in Psalm 82, the gods. G, uh, God says... I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. He's pronouncing judgment over the gods of the world. And then, what were they given authority over, by the way? The nations, the peoples, right? Let's fast forward a little bit to this passage called uh, Matthew 28, 18 and 20. This is the resurrected Christ. And he says this, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus, he died on the cross, 
redeeming mankind and he rose again from the dead and he says, I have been given authority over all of heaven and over all of the earth. And what does he do? Therefore go. There's this old Bible study axiom. Do you guys know it? Whenever you see a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. So that means that the clause that comes after the therefore is directly connected to the clause that comes before the therefore. So Jesus says, I have been given all authority. Remember what the kingdom is all about. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And because of that, I'm sending you to go out and make disciples of all the nations. This is what we call the Great Commission, and it is the proclamation of King Jesus. Jesus has risen from the dead, and he rules over all creation, and I am sent by him to bring his kingdom into the world. And in doing so, I am dethroning the gods of the nations. Jesus Christ is the God killer. He is the one who has come and by his authority sending out his church to begin to exercise his rule. In Matthew chapter 10, 7 and 8, Jesus tells the disciples, um, he says, uh, as you go, he, he gathers the 12, go and preach this message, the kingdom there's that, there's that kingdom thing again. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he tells them to do a few things. What does he tell them to do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have received, now freely give. What is he saying? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and I want you to demonstrate it through the healing of the sick. Why? Because the healing of the sick is the exercise of kingdom authority. We're not just supposed to talk about Jesus' rule. We're supposed to demonstrate it. Jesus, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says that the, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What does that mean? That means as agents of the kingdom of God, as you are being sent out by the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the message of King Jesus, you are also meant to demonstrate his rule through a show and tell gospel. What we're supposed to do is say Jesus is king and now as an agent of his authority, as a commissioned servant of the King Jesus, as his ambassador, I am imploring you to be reconciled to Christ, but I'm also going to demonstrate his kingdom authority by healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, and raising the dead. I want you to know that this is what my life is all about. And I myself has, have committed my life to one thing, to bring the rule of King Jesus everywhere I go. Uh, can I tell you a couple of testimonies? I, I, uh, I shared this testimony um, uh, last time I was here, I believe, but I, it's just so good, and I want to share it again. So if this is a rerun for you, I'm not sorry. You're going to hear it again. It's just that good. Uh, last year, I was out doing evangelism with my church, um, and we walked past this, uh, um, this uh, ice cream shop called the Dairy Go Round in Plymouth. And I did not want to be out doing evangelism. I was tired. And only four people showed up to do evangelism. Usually we have a larger crowd. And then when somebody said, oh, it's only four people, they went home. So it was just three of us. And I was like, you know what? Let's just go get ice cream. So uh, I'm discouraged I'm tired because I'd been working all day long, and I just decide I'm going to go to the dairy go round. I go, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do any outreach. I'm just going to get ice cream, and we're going to have a fun time with just this handful of saints that, that came. But I walk past this short woman with blonde hair, and the Holy Spirit says, go and talk to her. I interrupt her, and I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I, I know I'm interrupting you. I hope I'm not being rude, but 
I felt like God wanted me to talk to you. And um, are you dealing with anxiety that, that is just chronic and you get these dizzy spells? How did you know that? Are you a medium? And I'm like, no, uh, I'm just a pastor. Uh, but the Lord spoke to me and, and told me that that's what you were dealing with. And you've got an issue through your back too. Yes, in my feet as well. Can I pray for you for healing? Yes, you can pray, she says. So I grab her hand, I begin to pray, and the power of the Holy Spirit falls on her outside the dairy-go-round. And she feels the presence of God, and all of the pain leaves her body. And then I begin, as I demonstrated the rule of the kingdom, I just began to introduce her to the king. And I said, I, I want you to know, this happened because of Jesus, and I preached the gospel to her. And I talked about how Jesus died on the cross, and his sacrifice took on himself all of the sins that you've committed and the things you can't forgive yourself for. There was a price that must be paid, but it was paid by Jesus. And if you accept his gift, you can become a brand new person, and you die to your old life, and you receive a miracle on the inside of you by the Holy Spirit where you become a brand new person. We call it being born again. Would you want that? And she's literally jumping up and down saying, yes, yes, I want Jesus. I I want Jesus. And I led her to Christ right there. She was so excited, she ran home to tell her boyfriend who showed up to our house church meeting the following Tuesday. Well, there's a baptism happening that Tuesday because last Tuesday, I was driving home after a house church meeting and I see this guy staggering drunk on his way home and the Holy Spirit told me, pick him up and take him home. So I pick up my friend Justin yeah, I, he's not my friend Justin yet. He is now. I pull over and I said, man, do you need a ride home? He's like, yeah, I do. He was so drunk. He sounded exactly like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. And he, I said, you know, where, where am I taking you? He tells me where he lives. And I, he goes, what kind of service is this? And I said, it's not any kind of service. I'm just a pastor and God told me to pick you up. He goes, oh man, a pastor? You know, you cry out to the divine and hope for some sort of answer. And he goes, what does God think about suicide? And he shows me the scars on his arms where he had tried to commit suicide previously. He tells me that he caught another DUI, lost his license, lost his job, and is about to lose his apartment. He's going to be homeless, and he thought, you know what? I can't beat this addiction. I might as well just end it now. And... Uh, so whenever somebody asks you what God thinks about suicide, they're not asking a theological question. <laughs> and I just began to preach the gospel to him. And I tell him that God has a purpose for his life and that there's meaning. And I uh, connect him with my friend who he does home repair and uh, got him a job in, uh, the following Thursday. And I went to work with my friend Justin. And he begins to talk to me. He says, you know, John Mark, I know that God sent you to me. And this is an opportunity that I'm not going to waste. I'm not going to blow it. I said, well, man, I feel like your whole life you've been trying really hard, right? He says, yeah. I said, your trying hard has not gotten you anywhere. He's like, yeah, you're right. This is why Christians practice this thing called baptism. Because in baptism, you die to your old life. And you trust the Holy Spirit to make you a brand new person. We call it being born again. And in the water of baptism, you are killing the old man. And you ask God to do a miracle on the inside where you become brand new when you are raised up to new life from the water. He goes, I'm getting baptized. <laughs> so the following Tuesday, the bathtub is full, and everybody gathers into the bathroom of our house church as we're about to witness a funeral and a rebirth. And you remember that short blonde girl, her name is Allison. Her boyfriend, Robbie, is there for the very first time. 
And he's standing next to that bathtub when my friend Justin shares his testimony and says, when I met John Mark, I wanted to die. And tonight I get my wish. I'm dying to my old life and I'm receiving a new life in Jesus. Justin gets baptized. Meanwhile, Robbie is sobbing, weeping, as he's understanding the gospel for the first time. What you don't know about Robbie and Allie is that they were, they were eyeballs deep in heroin addiction for decades, their whole life. You know, Robbie, his hero was his brother who was a cocaine dealer. His mother was a cocaine addict and you know, he's attended many funerals due to drug addiction, and he's never known any different. He's never really heard the gospel. But he surrenders his life to Jesus. He gets baptized. He and Allie both get baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in tongues. And God delivered them a year ago from their addiction, and today they are still clean and sober, serving Jesus, in February, I got to perform their wedding. Why am I telling you this? Because that is the rule of King Jesus in effect. Because where he is in charge, suddenly there's order where there was chaos. Suddenly there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So wherever he's in charge, we see the effect of the kingdom. That's why we're not preaching a gospel that's just about talk, talk, talk. Well, this is a gospel that is power, and it's power to change people's lives. And it's power to set things into order. And when we are wrestling against the principalities and the powers of the air, what we are doing, we're not just... We're not in our prayer closets railing against these ethereal beings. Instead, real spiritual warfare is in the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. This is where spiritual warfare really is all about. Because I've got a question for you. Do you think the enemy knows that he can win? Do you think that he thinks he can win? He knows the end of the book better than you do, probably. He knows how the story ends. So why does the enemy keep fighting? Because in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says that the gospel, uh, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So, if the enemy can begin to distract you, if the enemy can begin to discourage you, what's his goal? Because his judgment is connected to the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom to every nation. Right? What's the goal of the enemy in spiritual warfare? to shut you up, to keep you from shining, to keep you from proclaiming the gospel in power. And sometimes the way that we fight spiritual warfare is directly connected. It, it, it actually just plays right into the enemy's hand. Because you begin when the enemy comes against you with spiritual warfare, through sickness and through whatever is going on, Maybe it's through the world and you see the chaos happening and you begin to get discouraged because you see what they're teaching in schools and, and the evil going on throughout the world. And you begin to just be like, oh, no, just let the rapture come and save us from all this stuff. The world's getting worse and worse and worse. When you do that, what you're doing is you are surrendering territory that you were never supposed to surrender. Instead... Here's how we fight spiritual warfare. We stand. The armor of God, which by the way, I don't have time to get into all this, but the armor of God is all the gospel. It's salvation, righteousness, peace, truth, right? It's just the gospel. 
and we stand firm believing the gospel for ourselves, but then we have the word of God as a sword. And what do we do? We preach the gospel and we pray. We preach the gospel and we pray. What are we praying for? Let's go back to our, our text. Um, this is, you know, Ephesians 6 again. Uh, verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. What are we praying for for the saints? The same thing that the Apostle Paul himself asked for intercession for this one thing. Would you pray that I would be bold to proclaim the gospel to all nations? Why? Because that's what spiritual warfare is all about. And if you become inward focused when spiritual warfare comes against you and you say, oh me and oh my, and you forget that you are an agent of the king and your job is to shine in the darkness, that there's territory to be taken. Oh, I don't need this anyway. <laughs> there's territory that is yet to be taken. And if... If we become so preoccupied with the things that we see on the news yesterday and today and tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and next decade, because it's never going to end. And if we allow the news to become our narrative, we've lost the plot because you've been given one task. It's to shine, to proclaim the gospel and to pray for the saints that we might be bold and proclaim the gospel ourselves. Amen? I'm going to wrap this up here. There's this guy in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. His name is Epaphras. The Apostle Paul, he gives, he gives an endorsement of his buddy Epaphras. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Epaphras is wrestling, struggling. The word is agonizomai, which means it's where we get this word agony. He's agonizing in prayer for what? For his own provision? No, I have a father who knows what I need before I even ask. I don't need to agonize for those things. Is he praying for healing? No, he's, he's not agonizing for healing. What is he agonizing over in prayer? For the maturity of the saints. Because I think that some of our maturity as the church has more to do with intercession and less to do with good teaching. I think sometimes we try to accomplish through teaching what really can only be done through intercession. And instead of talk, 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 I think, I think we should stand and we should put on the armor of God and standing firmly in the gospel, we should pray and make intercession with perseverance for all of the saints that we might be bold and proclaim the gospel. In Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were just thrown into prison because Peter healed the guy at the beautiful gate in Acts 3. And you guys remember the story. Peter and John went to pray. They found a lame man by the way. Do you guys know that story? He went walking and leaping and praising God. Anyway, so um, I spent a lot of time in Sunday school. <laughs> I'm a pastor's kid. So um, Peter and John heal this man by the beautiful gate. He's a cripple. He's a beggar. They Say, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What happened? A healing. A healing. It's important. We should never compromise on healing. So a healing happens, and what happens? A crowd gathers, and Peter begins to proclaim the gospel. 
of the rule of King Jesus, that he rose from the dead after being crucified. Well, what happens? The guys who crucified Jesus get a little bit miffed about it, and they call Peter and John before the council. They are arrested, and they're brought before the council, and they said, you know what we did to Jesus, and if you keep speaking in his name, we'll do the same things to you too. And Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, says, you judge for yourselves which is better, to obey God or to obey men. And he leaves. I love that. So he leaves and then he comes before the saints, the believers, to report to them what had happened. And as you can imagine, they're intimidated. They're intimidated. This is scary stuff. But on their release, Peter and John went back to their people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, They raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. What is the answer to resistance and spiritual warfare? Lord, would you fill us with your spirit, enable us to speak your word boldly, and would you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders to glorify the name of Jesus everywhere we go. Would you stand with me? Here's what we're going to do. I just want you to put a hand on the person next to you because we're going to intercede for one another. I want you to know My family right now is going through the worst, the worst moment of our lives. My sister has been in the hospital for a month, and she is very sick, and she is, has been at least, on the brink of death. That's why I'm preaching and not my father, who was who is on the schedule. And as I was driving here, I said, Lord, I cannot wait to preach the gospel. I cannot wait to punch the devil in the face. I cannot wait to stand up and to fight because this is spiritual warfare, the proclamation of the gospel and the intercession for the saints to pray and, and, and to speak the word with boldness. And here's another thing I want to do just because I hate Satan. I want to pray for the sick. And I want to pray for anyone especially who's dealing with any issues in the kidneys or the liver because those are the things that my sister needs healing for. And I want to see the kingdom of God come. If you are here and you need healing in the kidneys or the liver, would you just raise your hand? Because we're going to pray. I see that hand. I see that hand. Who else right there? Right there. In the name of, how many of you, you are experiencing symptoms right now? It's, it's hurting or you feel pain. Uh, would you uh, wave at me? Most of that is sort of like under the radar type of stuff. In the name of Jesus, I speak healing over your bodies. I speak healing over your bodies in Jesus' name. Every single person who is struggling with issues in the kidneys or in the liver, I speak healing over you. And Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done. 
And ma'am, over here on the, on the left in the green, it's not, you're not just dealing with an issue in the organs. You're, it's like there's been an, a, a whole issue through your back, um, at your spine right here. Is that right? Am I right about that? No, I'm wrong about that. Well, in the name of Jesus, I bless your health. I bless your health. Not just this, Lord, but the, 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 every, uh, the stress of what's happening in her family and the things that she's carrying presently. I thank you, Jesus, that you're setting her free and you're lifting that burden because it's not yours to carry, ma'am. It is the burden of the Lord. And uh, Father, I thank you that right now you're setting her free in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And there's, there's one young lady over, uh, all the way over here to my right on the left, and you're wearing black. Uh, um, about um, midway through, um, I, I, I felt like you have been under such a heavy load over the last two years. And I felt like you needed to hear that God really does love you. And he really is for you. And he's going to set you free. And that burden that you've been carrying, it's manifested in many ways, including insomnia and, and, and a few areas. I just feel like you need to know that God really does, does love you. He really does love you. All right. Let's begin to pray for one another. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you rest upon us? And would you fill us with boldness? If you have your prayer language, I just want you to begin to pray in tongues. Lord, would you make your church a light to the world? Lord, would you fill us with boldness that the kingdom of God would be advanced through your church? Lord Jesus, would you use us to proclaim your kingdom? Would you use us in great boldness, Lord? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders that Jesus would be glorified through your church? Father, would you give us boldness to get ourselves into trouble? You understand that Peter and John and the believers, what they got in trouble for was proclaiming the word with boldness and for healing of the sick. And what is the thing that they pray for? Give us more boldness and do more miracles. Some of you, when you're asking for spiritual warfare, you're signing up for a fight. And you're asking to get into trouble with the world. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to, with a smile on your face and love in your heart, say, what is it better, to obey men or to obey God? I want to preach the gospel. I want to win the lost. I want to see the kingdom of God come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's take a few more minutes and Let's wait on the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Rest upon us in fresh measure. Empower us to preach the gospel. Empower your church. Listen, you don't need to have a microphone to preach the gospel. You don't need to be a pastor to preach the gospel. You just need to say, Lord, help me to open my mouth wherever I am to proclaim the rule of your kingdom, to bring order where there's chaos. Help me to shine in the middle of difficulty. We're not on defense. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. I've never seen a gate being used for offensive purposes. Gates are meant to keep other people out. And if the gates of hell are not prevailing against us, who's on offense and who's on defense? I've got news for you. 
you're not under attack from the enemy. The enemy is under attack by the church. The enemy is under attack by the church. And it's time we stop playing defense. It's time we take ground for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you want prayer, if you want healing, would the prayer team come forward? If you want prayer, I want to pray for you. But if you... If you're here and you have not yet surrendered to King Jesus, you have not been born again in that miracle that I was talking about where you die to your old life and you receive a new life from the King. If you've never really experienced that, if you've never really had that, but you want to, you want to know that your sins are forgiven, you want to know that you're surrendered to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, if you want to be part of this kingdom and you're not yet, but you want to be, would you raise your hand because this morning Jesus will do something in you. You don't have to wait to get ready to get saved to come to Jesus. Instead, Jesus is giving you an invitation right now. And listen, with the attack I'm going through, I want to see, I want to see the devil pay. You know how he pays? When people surrender to a different king. They rebel against Satan and they surrender to King Jesus. If you want to rebel against Satan and surrender to Jesus, would you raise your hand? In Jesus' name, I pray that every soul that needs to be regenerated by the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, would you do a work? Would you do a work? Would you do a work? Would you make us brand new? New creations. New creations. I've got one last question and I'm, I'm going to be done and I've drawn this out a bit. I'm not sorry about it though. How many people need healing? Would you just raise your hand if you need healing? Just keep it up so that I can see. Would you raise, if, if you're able to, raise a hand high enough so that I can see. Um, if there's somebody that's around you with their hand up, I want you to look around and I want you to put a hand on the person holding up their hand. When somebody has a hand on your shoulder, you can put your hand down. There's a hand back here, hand over here, hand over here. I want every person that needs a healing, there's a hand back there all the way in the back, all the way in the back who doesn't yet have somebody to lay hands on him. Because there will probably be many people who need healing. I have seen so many miracles happen just like this when we pray for the sick all together. And so you get to participate in spiritual warfare by praying for the sick. Here's what I want you to do very briefly. I just want you to ask the person that, whose uh, shoulder you're touching... Ask them what, what are, give, give them a target, what, what needs healing. You don't have to go, get into the whole long story. We still have a hand right over here, Pastor Toby. Um, just give them a target to attack, all right? Once you get that target, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to ask Lord, would you please heal X, Y, and Z? Instead, by the authority of King Jesus, I want you to begin to speak to the mountain to move. In Jesus' name, those kidneys, those livers be healed. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we speak healing to every knee. We speak healing to every back. We speak healing to every shoulder. Lord, every heart. I felt like I was supposed to pray for heart conditions as well. If you have a heart condition in Jesus' name, I speak to that heart to be made whole. I speak right now to the central nervous system to be healed in Jesus' name for people who are dealing with nerve damage through their limbs. Father, we thank you that you're bringing healing in Jesus' name. Let the kingdom of heaven come. I speak healing right now to the gallbladder, people dealing with issues in the gallbladder, people with cysts on the ovaries, in Jesus' name, I speak healing to you now, in Jesus' name. People with endometrial problems, I speak healing right now, in Jesus' name. 
here's what I want you to do. If whatever what you were dealing with was causing pain or limiting motion or whatever, you could experience the symptoms right now, I want you to test out your body. I want you to do something you couldn't do. I want you to, to, to as an act of faith, do something that you couldn't do before. And if you feel like there was a change, something happened, I want you to wave a hand at me. Over here, hallelujah. Who else? You felt a change. Something's happening. Over here, praise God. Who else? There's something happening. Uh, sir, um, the first guy, you raise your hand. What's happening in you? Your ankle, what was wrong with it? It hurt? And does it hurt still? Not now. Not now. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord. Who else? You, you needed healing and, and, and you can do something you couldn't do. I want you to still try testing out your bodies. Over here, what's going on? Come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. She had arthritis through her whole body. Her wrist was killing her. She had surgery and the surgery didn't work. And now her, her wrist is totally healed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Who else? There's a healing happening in your body. You can feel something changing as you begin to move. Anybody else? How many of you, uh, over here, what's happening? Praise the Lord. Tremors greatly reduced. And in Jesus' name, we speak to that tremor to leave completely. Father, we thank you for what you've begun. And we trust that you're not going to leave her halfway healed. Lord, I thank you for your power at work. Just to give an update for those of you with my sister, um, we are seeing, a, uh, we're seeing God at work. We're seeing God at work. She's, we're, she's not out of the woods yet, but we're seeing God move. And uh, her liver numbers are going down, which is a good thing. And, and we're seeing God do good things in my sister. In spite of me just... <laughs> Yesterday and two days ago, I think I was the saddest I had ever been. Because I thought, you know, I just, you don't know. But I was so excited and so grateful to proclaim a God who heals to you. And to see him at work in people's bodies. To see him at work in people's souls. And here's what I want you to do. Will you fight with me? In, in the face of what's happening in our nation, will you be a church that shines and proclaims the gospel of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who begins to have hope that it's not in our political leader, but it is in the King? Amen? Amen. 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 Pastor Toby. Thank you, John Mark. Have you been... Uh, yeah. I know you've been uh, blessed today. We've been blessed today as a church. And uh, listen, fight the good fight. This is not over. This is, uh, you know, and if you've experienced healing today, that's, that's exciting. But continue to fight the fight. Continue, you know, to, to persevere. Continue to go forward. That's the message for us today. And, and that's... And, 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 you know, that spiritual warfare, that, that, that is, uh, you know, they, it isn't won overnight. God calls us and he, and he takes us. And so, so we need to remember that as, as, as we go forward. This, this is not over and we continue to persevere in the name of Jesus. Amen. We continue to fight in the name of Jesus. We continue to stand on his name. Amen. That's how we receive abundant life. Amen. It's been great this morning. Lewis, and we're going to continue. Uh, in, I'm, I'm going to pray in just a second. I'm going to, I'm going to dismiss you. But uh, if, if you're not done, uh, there's the prayer teams will be here. And I will be here. John Mark will be here. Um, we'd love to pray with you. If, if you don't mind, after I pray, if you, if you would leave quietly and take your conversations in, into the hallway, we'd appreciate that. But... Uh, God is good as love endures. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. We thank you 
for your servant. We thank you for his message. A message of deliverance, a message of healing, a message of victory that we have in you. And we, we, re, we will take that with us as we leave this place. We thank you for it. We love you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.